The human gait cycle is divided into eight phases. At every single one, there are key tasks the body has to complete, which are much more complex but also much more fascinating than it might seem at first glance. A whole gait cycle is first of all defined from heel strike to heel strike of the reference leg we are looking at. First of all, we can classify the gait cycle whether the leg has ground contact or not. At normal walking speeds, the stance phase accounts for 60% and the swing phase for 40% of the gait cycle. As said, at normal walking speeds, the faster you walk, the shorter the duration of the stance phase gets. This explains why unsecure patients walk slower. They want to increase the amount of time with two feet safely on the ground. The very first gait phase is not really a phase. It is a single moment. The initial contact, the foot touches the ground, optimally with the heel first. Patients with the paralysis of the tibialis anterior muscle, contractures or spasticity might not achieve that. This is the first deviation you can look at. How does the foot touch the ground? Depending on the cause, if the foot is correctable and what the overall treatment goal is. In orthosis, electrical stimulation are measures to help with this specific deviation. The loading response phase following the initial contact is a real phase. A lot is happening here. It starts at the initial contact and it ends when the contralateral leg loses ground contact. The purpose of this phase is to load the whole body weight on the reference leg and to end the bipedal phase. This increases the load on the leg and key muscles have to start working. The quadriceps and the tibialis anterior are active in an eccentric manner. The knee flexes approximately 15 to 20 degrees to help absorb the impact during weight transfer. Due to the increased knee flexion moment on the quadriceps muscle, it is required to really put in some work. The same is true for the tibialis anterior. What happens if a patient has a weakness in the quadriceps muscle in this gait phase? The knee would flex uncontrollably and the patient would fall. So they avoid the stance phase flexion completely and in the case of the foot show a sudden plantar flexion like a slapping motion which you can hear every time the foot hits the ground. This reduces in consequence gait economy and quality. With this knowledge you can now understand much more. This is the reason some technicians are using knee joints in the orthotics which are located more dorsally. This decreases the knee flexion torque on the leg in this exact gait phase and therefore enables a weaker quadriceps muscle to secure the knee more easily. In prosthetics, the stance phase flexion of roughly 15 degrees is very important to know. You are aiming to meet this figure during a fitting for your prosthetic leg. And prosthetic foot manufacturers enable prosthetic users to change the softness of the heel in order to tune the skate phase to the liking. Do you see now why this is so important to understand? Next, the mid stance phase. It begins when the contralateral leg is off the ground and ends when the center of gravity is above the middle of our reference leg. That means the whole body weight is now fully supported by one leg and moves forward in a controlled manner. This is also controlled by the musculus soleus, which regulates the dorsiflexion of the upper ankle joint very precisely. If this muscle is too weak or otherwise impaired, patients have a really hard time shifting the weight forward or otherwise they would fall. But in the case you're using orthotics, a limitation of dorsiflexion will unfold its effect right here and will start to promote the need to extend. Because the patient runs into the, for example, 0 degrees dorsiflexion limitation, this lets the ground reaction force travel further to the distal parts of the foot and therefore promote knee extension. Another very interesting phenomenon can be watched from the frontal perspective. Due to the fact that the body weight is only supported by one leg, the hip abductors have to put in some serious work now in order to prevent the pelvis from tilting to the contralateral side. And if it does, this is called a Trendelenburg sign. And this is a hint for insufficient hip abductors. And now let's look at the terminal stance phase. It begins where the last phase ended. The center of gravity is above our supporting leg and it ends when the contralateral side has ground contact. The ankle joint is now maximally plantar flexed and pushes us forward. This creates high torques at the knee, which has to fight against the high extension moments. Which muscle do you think does that? When we look up, what the musculus gastrocnemius actually does, it says plantar flexion and knee flexion. This is the exact moment where this muscle really shines. The gastroc muscle is the main player now preventing the knee to get hyperextended. A paralyzed gastroc will then lead to an increased risk for a genorecovatum. Let that sink in. Did you know that? Not only that, 
but also a paralysis of the musculus soleus makes it nearly impossible for the patient to get through the skate phase. The ground reaction force vector travels to the distal parts of the foot and pushes the foot into dorsiflexion. The calf has not only to negate this, but reverse it and propose the body forward with a well-timed plantar flexion against the ground reaction force. Patients with calf weaknesses most often will avoid putting pressure on the forefoot because otherwise they would just fall. The same is true for partial foot amputations. Even though the calf is mostly strong enough, the forefoot lever is just missing. And this is the reason why forefoot amputations beginning at the Chopin level and calf weaknesses should be treated biomechanically the same by substituting the function of the calf by an AFO with a dorsiflexion stop, a sufficient forefoot and a ventral shell. Biomechanically, completely the same. Now the pre-swing phase. Start at the initial contact of the contralateral leg and it ends when the foot of the reference leg loses ground contact. This phase might not look like much, but a lot is happening here, which we can further use to treat patients even better. If you want to influence the gait or understand prosthetic components, this is where you should really pay close attention. In this phase, the resistance of the forefoot decides how smooth you are going to enter the swing phase. A stiff forefoot, for example, in prosthetic feet, lets the ground reaction force vector travel to a more anterior position. But it feels like you are getting pushed back and are walking over a hill. Whereas with a soft forefoot, you get the exact opposite and you are kind of falling on the contralateral side. Manufacturers of prosthetic feet or orthotists should strive for the optimal balance and consider what you want to achieve here. Either promote an easier rollover phase or focus on stabilization. The initial swing phase. It starts when the toes of the reference leg are leaving the ground and it ends at maximum knee flexion of the reference leg. The hip and knee are flexing now enabling the leg to swing through. The maximum knee flexion angle is roughly 60 to 65 degrees and it's largely speed independent. Good prosthetic MPK knees are trying to hit the 60 degrees as best as they can. In the mid-swing phase, the leg is now actually swinging through. This phase starts at maximum knee flexion and ends when the lower leg is vertical to the ground. The main focus here is not to trip. Contractures pain or any other factors who are hindering knee and hip flexion and ankle dorsiflexion are increasing the risk of tripping or are promoting typical compensations, which you really should know. 1. They increase the knee flexion to gain ground clearance. 2. They can vault, which is the plantar flexion of the contralateral leg in the skate phase, which pushes the whole body up a bit. 3. They can hip hike in which they push their hip of the affected side up, which raises the whole leg from the ground, or four, the circumduction, in which the whole leg is abducted in the frontal plane and swings through in a circular motion to avoid the trip. So if you see these compensations in this gait phase, look for the cause and not just for symptoms. Treat the cause and the symptoms disappear. And the last one, the terminal swing phase. It starts when the lower leg of the reference leg is vertical and ends with initial contact. Now the leg has to be stopped in a well-controlled manner. Our hamstrings are doing their job here. On the other hand, prosthetic knees need a well-calibrated extension resistance that is just enough to slow down the leg, but not too much, so that you would risk the patients from loading with a flexed knee and have the risk of falling. As you can see, the devil is in the details. So as a wrap up, every gate phase has a purpose. Every gate phase has opportunities for professionals to be optimized and analyzed. These were just a fraction of facts and just simple examples to show you how important it is to know every single gate phase. Please leave your thoughts in the comments. Are you analyzing the gait of patients? What do you do in your profession? Please like and subscribe and we will see you in the next video. At Got It.